Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Where the 99 Lead. It's a program brought to you by the University of Pikeville where we discuss many different subjects around the University of Pikeville. The Coleman College of Business, the Patton College of Education, Kentucky College of Osteopathic Medicine, now the Kentucky College of Optometry. Different academic programs, different athletic programs at the university as well. The title of the show, Where the 99 Lead, refers to the historic 99 steps that lead to campus, but also lead from campus back into the community and into the world. We meet many different people in and around the University of Pikeville during the course of this show's run. And today we're joined by adjunct instructor of art, Paula Smith. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You uh, have been around art on the junior high, high school, college level. And we're gonna talk about that and a special event that you have as you're currently featured on campus. But before we do that, let's talk about your background. Let's talk about where you have taught and the lives that you've affected teaching art, your background and, and now how you have, have, have arrived at the university. Well, I grew up right here uh, and I attended Millard High School. Graduated as valedictorian, um, had an art award, a math award, and a few other awards. And this guy you may know, Ron Dameron, was my teacher, teacher at the time. How about that? And so he walked up to me and said, you need to go to college. Yes. And so he sort of gave me the pathway here, and I went up the 99, yes. actually when you had to walk up the 99. Sure. And uh, I went to school here for um, around three years or so, decided to go to UK to further my art, and um, graduated from there. And then I have a master's from Moorhead, uh -huh. and I also have a rank one in art, art ed, so been around a while. And uh, you've uh, worked with students at the junior high and high school level. Talk about that. Yes, well, um, I think I was born to teach because I started teaching Sunday school when I was probably eight years old. Right. And I've always taught. Um, I've worked s summer school with kids even when I was younger than they were. Yeah. Uh, but um, I have taught from the sixth grade to high school level, even adult cl classes. So it's a big, big range. You must love art and oh, have a passion for that. I really do. Um, to me, you cannot be an person with an ed education if you don't know about art. Mm -hmm. Everything evolves from art, math, science, history, everything. And so if you can study that one s subject, you'll touch on a lot of other, other ones. Right. I would imagine during your course of time in the classroom that you've encountered students like me <laughs> that don't consider themselves artistic, that maybe it's a requirement, or maybe we're trying to expand our own uh, mm -hmm. boundaries and, and trying to learn something from the world of art. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your time in the classroom. How do you break down those boundaries for those students like me? whether I'm a sixth grader or an adult mm -hmm. trying to learn art. How do you break down those barriers for those of us that don't see ourselves artistic? Well, first I say art shows no fear. So you have to make sure you're confident. And you start bringing them up a little bit at a time with simple things and eventually uh, they make wonderful works of art. And I've always had uh, in my classroom, I've never had a student who couldn't do art. It just depends on how you approach them, the medium, um, how you guide them. But I'm sure I could teach you to draw. Very I'm good. positive. For someone who doesn't find themselves artistic, where would you start? What medium would you go to? W would it be drawing? Would it be watercolors? W w where would you go? Most people would say to draw. Yeah. But I feel like if you start with watercolor, you can be as loose as you want to be. So you can start with washes and then you add the detail and then the layers build up and pretty soon you have a painting. Yeah. So to me, I think watercolor is a really good, good way to, to start. I've spent my entire life doodling, trying <laughs> to make something come out that someone else would want to look at. <laughs> I still haven't gotten there. I have a great appreciation for art and those that can take something from their mind mm -hmm. and turn it into something that we stand in awe of. Uh, I, I will tell you this story. I have a lot of teaching stories. Sure. Um, when I first moved back here, I worked in Floyd Ca County, 
and uh, I was the first art teacher these students have ever had. So one teacher came to me and she said, do you mind if you have a special needs student? I said, no, great, Br you know, bring them in. So um, we were mi mixing red and green and yellow and you know, making the colors that day. And uh, so I said, sit down here. And I took some yellow, I took some blue, and I mixed green. And he grabbed my hands and said, oh, you have magic in your hands. Yeah. And that has stayed with me. Yeah. Because as a teacher, you do have magic. You have magic to change the world. Sure. And so he painted and mixed colors for the rest of the time, but had a really good, and good time with you've probably him. mixed colors hundreds if not thousands of times right. and taking that for granted. Right, exactly. But that was magic to him. Right. It opened eyes. Right, and that's, and that's what, what good art does. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great part of, of being in the classroom, I would imagine. Your work's currently featured in the Weber Art Gallery on New Pikes campus. Give us an overview of that show. Tell us about some of the pieces that we'll see. Okay. Um, well, I wanted that to be a retrospective show, so I have artwork from my years as a bear. Uh, I have work from uh, 1979, 80, and then I have work from my, my masters and also my professional work as well. Sure. Um, and I did that because I felt like for the students here at U UPIC, it's good to see how you start out yeah. and how you change and how you move and how sure. your, your thoughts and what you paint will change. Right. So uh, it's, it's called a little, a little bit of everything. How has your work evolved? Oh, well, you know, I think about that sometimes, and um, my techniques have been my own, and I think that's a good thing. Uh -huh. Original pieces, um, I'm really thinking about my heritage now, and I think you kind of do that as you grow old, sure. older. Um, and my work is more uh, tighter now, I guess, than it used to be. Um, but still, I'm flexible. What, to me, you know, People say, well, that's a certain style with a work of art. But what really makes the style is what you, for me, is subject matter. So I can change how I paint and what, and what I do in order to be true to what I'm trying to paint. You know, you can't, you can't change how something is. And when you look at it, I'll say, I'll say that's watercolor. No, that's charcoal. No, that's pastel. I know exactly what I need to do right. to pull those elements out to make that work of art successful. Sure. Paula Smith, uh, adjunct instructor of art at the University of Pike Bar, guest on this edition, currently showing at the Weber Art Gallery on U Pike's campus. You can see her work. Uh, and as an artist, you talk about the different types of art, drawing, charcoals, mm -hmm. pastels, mm -hmm. watercolors, uh, those type of things that you have paints uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, those are all different types of art for me as an as a non-artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that. But inspiration, mm -hmm. where does that come from? Where do you draw that? Where does that mm -hmm. become what you put on canvas? Mm -hmm. I see the mountains rolling by against a pink September sky. And in this moment I can see the passing of eternity. That's something I thought up and say because what it means to me is that when you look at a work of art, I always think about the person, the place, and I think about um, w what it means, uh, what that work of art means, what it's going to evolve to, and I just, I can see things and I know exactly what it's going to look like before it gets done. Um, and it's just the way that you approach subject matter. Right. And to me, um, the subject dictate, dictates what I'm going to use. So like charcoal or, you know, whatever, the subject leads me. Sure. You know what a work of art is going to look like when you start. I do. Really? I do. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have dreamed paintings before and got up the next day and paint, uh, painted them. Have you ever sure. taken it to an extreme that you've gotten up in the middle of, of the night? Yes, I have. Yes. And that's where some of the creativity comes from. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because we've heard stories of uh, uh, Hall of Fame artists, musicians, mm -hmm. 
that will dream a song mm -hmm. and oh, wake yes. up in the middle of the night and write mm -hmm. that song or go play that song mm -hmm. or record that song. Mm -hmm. So it happens with you too. Oh yes. It's part of the creative mind. Right. And it comes from different sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. I understand. Scientists have told me that's why I'm not an artist. <laughs> I've got the other side of the brain. I don't have that side. I appreciate what you've got. Inspiration. Tell us about different types of works. We're going to see at the Weber Art Gallery, mm -hmm. but what types of things will we see there? Will we see mountains? Will we see uh, people? Will mm -hmm. we see, what, what will we, we see there? Well, uh, in my, well, I have sculpture that I made um, at UK and okay. it's aluminum that was cast in sand. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a unique way to make a piece of art. Sure. Um, I have a painting, well, I guess it's really not a painting, it's a fingerprint por portrait. So I have a large por portrait where I, I used a stamp pad and my fingerprints to create the portrait. Right. So that's all fingerprints. So I didn't have to sign it because I had my prints on it. <laughs> yeah. And then I have watercolor, uh, I have pet portraits, I have um, the images from this er area like I have um, my father with uh, um, my nephew, I have my mom and dad, images of my mom and dad, sure. cold camp towns, uh, home places, cabins. Um, I have a beautiful piece that has uh, the hands of an old uh, gentleman with his tomatoes and green peppers pour yeah. pouring out of his hands. Right. So it's just kind of an eclectic top. Sure. But the thing I think that holds the work together is my motto for my art business is that in every life there's a work of art. Right. So if you ask me, if you say, I want you to do a work of art for, for me, I would question you about your life and what you've done and who, sure. you know, things like that. Then I would suggest, well, maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that. Because in every life, there is a work of art. There's something about you that needs to be painted, drawn, pasteled, something in your life sure. that can make a work of art. Or maybe use a piece of coal. The exhibit features unique pieces that include coal as a medium, I understand. Mm -hmm, true. Why were you inspired to incorporate coal into your artwork? Well, <clears throat> you have to know I grew, I grew up a miner's uh, child. So Many of us did. Yeah, so that's always been there. Um, but I watched the big branch upper, the upper big branch mine disaster. Right. And I was looking at the faces of the people and I thought, these are my people. I mean, I don't know them, right. but I knew them. Sure. I thought about how coal is so uh, embedded in our lives and it just hit me. Can I paint with coal? Right. Can I figure out a way to embed coal into my watercolors? And I decided I was gonna try. Mm -hmm. So I went to coal camps and got coal. I went to mines. I've met a lot of my miners. They would bring me different types of coal. Sure. And then I worked to create a binder that would make it all work. So right. these works of art, it's, they're so fascinating because the three different seams of coal I use, each seam has a different color, texture, value. Right. So like the Pocahontas seam is, is sort of in the middle. A soil seam is, is spelled S-E-W-E-L-L. It's soft and velvety. Mm -hmm. And then the Pond Creek seam is the roughest seam. Right. So it has little bits of dirt and rock so it kind of adds a little bit of a difference. Sure. So. so you've got different textures. I do. And they are bound by watercolors. Mm-hmm. And my binder. And your binder. <laughs> uh -huh. Which I understand is a secret recipe. It is. I worked on it a long time to try to figure out how to keep the coal from to separate from the watercolor. Yes. And I tried different ways to do it and finally hit on it and that's something I'm keeping with me. There's a rumor <laughs> that it's cornbread batter. <laughs> <laughs> Got to tell you, there's a rumor floating around that has to do with cornbread batter. Might be possible. It could be. <laughs> you can incorporate so many things into art. And uh, Paula uh, is, of course, our guest on this edition has incorporated coal, which I think is very cool. I've got to get to the gallery and check that out. Uh, but you talk about coal seams working with the watercolor, different colors. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think many people in our region, even those that are coal miners' kids. Mm -hmm. We we come from coal families that right. grew up here in coal country. I don't think many of those even realize that the different seams that are worked, mm -hmm. there are different types of coal out there. Right. Further right. educating through the use of art. Right. 
Uh, you, you talk about uh, the different coals affecting the process. How difficult was it? How did it change the process using the different types of coal from the different seams? Did it change the binder? Mm -hmm. Did it change the watercolors? Did it change any of those things in the process? It changes the texture because sometimes the coal will do its own thing and separate and you just have to, the coal helps you paint. Mm -hmm. it, it'll do its thing and watercolor is kind of like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I use thicker coal and even sometimes I will just put a handful of coal on there mm -hmm. and just work it into the paper. Right. So there's just a lot of different ways that you can make the texture show. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. What's your favorite piece of artwork that's included in the show? That's hard to say because... Kind of like picking a f favorite child. Sort yeah. of like picking a favorite child, exactly. Um, I love them each for their u unique purpose, um, and I really can't pick favorite ones. But I will tell you this. Um, sometimes I'll have a miner's wife call me and say, uh, I have a picture of my hus husband in the mines. Would you paint this for sure. me? And so, of course, I'll say yes. and and I'll paint the picture and call the lady and say, okay, it's ready. And um, I'll meet them somewhere and unveil the, the painting and husband, of course, is there. And they'll just get all cry. Oh, wow. Because I think for, for the gentleman, for the man, he sees his life elevated. Yeah. Something he's done all of his life. True. Something he's done to feed his fa family is now framed and in a work of art and it's gonna last forever. Yeah. So I always say if I make them cry, I know I did a good job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, I really enjoy those works of art. Art brings emotion. Oh, it does. Uh, and in many different ways, mm -hmm. in many different ways. Uh, simply showing an appreciation for a, a hardworking coal miner, husband, mm -hmm. father, uh, provider. Mm -hmm brings emotion to That's that family true. and it's brought out by a, something that began in your head and someone else's image put on canvas mm -hmm. and it brings those emotions and uh, we'll be a part of that family I would imagine oh, forever. I'm sure. Yeah. I hope. <laughs> uh, how does art impact students in the classroom, learning in other classes and fit <laughs> into the overall liberal arts education? Because art is a liberal arts kind of thing. There are many people that may be are required to have art mm -hmm. because they're working on a business degree or a biology mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. but they're required to have art. How right. does it help? Well, first of all, when you study art, you study yourself. You study where you came from, you study uh, how we grew, how we lived, uh, you study how uh, politics, social studies, it's all involved in, in uh, the arts. But the biggest thing, I think, if you, even if you have a studio class, it makes you take a leap of faith. It makes you put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes you do something that you're not comfortable with, but then all of a sudden, you are. True. So I think that it makes you um, be more educated in the fact that it rewires your brain. And that's the important thing about art. That whole left brain, right brain exactly. thing. Exactly, yeah. It, it certainly does. Uh, you're currently teaching classes at mm -hmm. the University of Pikeville. Uh, tell us about what classes you're teaching. I teach art appreciation. I teach the beginning art history. And I teach advanced art history. So those are the three courses. Very good. And some of those courses you're seeing students that are non-art majors. Yes, that absolutely. That because of the requirements of liberal arts, you're seeing those students. Mm -hmm. um, when do you, do you see the, the light bulb effect with those students when they may be non-art people mm -hmm. and, and they get it, the, the light bulb goes off mm -hmm. and do you see that in students? Oh yes, lots of times I'll have students come back and say, you know, I think I'm gonna take an art class, yeah. you know, or I never really realized that the Egyptians did this yeah. or, because really what I try to, to teach in art history is that we're all the same. Yeah. It's a humanity, and it's been that way since, you know, the beginning of time. Sure. And art is something that pulls everyone together. We're, we're all 
cut from the same piece of cloth. Right. And so that's what I, that's what I like about it. It really, uh, I think, makes them think about more than just trying to get a grade. You know, it's it makes you evaluate. Sure. And look. Right. Those that might rush through mm -hmm. a an art museum mm -hmm. prior to an art appreciation course now will pause at each painting at each piece of art after that art appreciation course uh, i've seen the light bulb go off <laughs> and while some of us are not artists you can develop a great appreciation for art in an art appreciation course that you have a a non-major student mm -hmm. in that art appreciation course what type, different types of art will they see from what different eras? Uh, just an example or two of the types of art they'll see in that class. In art appreciation uh, is more of a v varied type, so they might see the Venus of Willendorf, which is a pre prehistoric statue, mm -hmm. and then I might pair that with a Greek statue and say, let's talk about the similarities and differences, you know, materials, sure. time frame. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of that compare contrast um, thing, and I believe that makes them understand that it's a ho holistic type of study. Sure. Art appreciation being taught there, and uh, you're working with college students now. You've worked with students as young as sixth grade. Mm -hmm. What are the differences? What are the similarities? Um, sixth grade students can't wait to get their hands on <laughs> sure. stuff to draw with. Yes. But um, I think it's kind of the same because it's if you haven't had art, you're sort of at that same level. Right. You know, you have to try to open up the brain, open up their eyes. So it's basically to me the same. You want to throw things out there, get their interest up, you know, give them a ch challenge. So to me, it's kind of kind of the same. Right. Uh, our guest on this edition of Where the 99 Lead, Paula Smith, adjunct instructor of art at the University of Pikeville and uh, an artist in her own right, uh, teaching at the University of Pikeville or outside the University of Pikeville. What's your favorite class to teach and why? Mm. You mean for any age group? Any or age group, man? your favorite class to teach? Mm. Probably watercolor and probably to um, eighth graders. Ah, even the specific age. Mm -hmm. Why so? Um, eighth graders are um, uh, smart, ready to learn. They have in energy, and yeah. they'll try anything. Right. And everything they do, they think, "Oh man, that's good." Yes. So that's what you want, yeah. you know. So that that gives me the energy to to help them. Very good. Yeah. You're currently showing at the Weber Art Gallery on campus. Uh, tell us about some of the pieces you've created professionally that maybe aren't in this show, but some other pieces. Uh, talk about some of the things you've done professionally. Um, well, I have to talk about one piece that's in my show. Okay. It's the 1915 mi Minor, and that's the one I painted first with coal, coal dust. Uh -huh. And that's an image of my grandfather going into the mines at age 17. Wow. And it has three men in it. So my grandfather's at the wheel, you know, really ready to go. In the middle, there's like a cocky young guy. And in the back, there's an old man going, oh, boys, you don't know what you're getting into. Right. So uh, that piece, I think, I've sold that piece quite a lot. A lot of people um, buy it, but I've also given it to Governor Bashir and several other people around yeah. because they really like that uh, that piece of art. So that's, that's one piece. Um, I do landscapes. I have a couple of those in my show, mm -hmm. and I love to paint landscapes, especially when you think about how the spring mountains have the the pink and the white, and it just and the purple or brown of the mountains. Right. So when those things inspire me, I'll just you know ha I have to paint. Right. Do you paint every day? Um, not every day. Probably about every three or four days, depends on if right. I'm teaching. In the summer, I paint every day. Sure. But when I have a job, of course, you know. How many hours hard. How many hours a day? Well, um, I can paint up to eight to 10 hours a day. Right. Usually my husband will say, uh, you need to take a break. And I'll say, oh, give me f five minutes. Sure. He'll come back again and say, you need to take a break. Right. Uh, and I, I said, I told you five minutes. Uh -huh. And he'll say, Paula, that was three hours ago. Yeah, so exactly. you get so, 
obsessed and so into it, but it's not a tiring thing. Sure. You know, the more you paint, I think the more you want to paint. And Do you draw a blank? Do you ever draw a blank uh, where you're in the midst of one of those, uh, give me five minutes and it's mm -hmm. three hours. Obviously, you're not drawing a blank thing. Right, right. But do you have a time where you feel like, okay, I want to paint today, and there's just nothing there? Mm. Can't really say, say that. That's an artist. <laughs> I think speaking. there's always something there, you know. There's an artist speaking <laughs> there. Those of us that aren't artists don't get it, mm -hmm. and that's why we appreciate what you do. Uh, of course, teaching commissioned pieces aside, if you could work on any piece you like, what would you create? Mm. I love landscapes. I love the area we live in. Sure. The mountains, the rivers, the the trees, the change of seasons. Um, those are the things that I think will last. You know, that's why I say you see the mountains and when I paint it, it's eternity. Right. You know, so I think landscapes, that's probably the thing I would paint if I had to make a choice. We've got a lot of inspiration out there. All we have to do is look out our windows. Exactly. And just pay attention mm -hmm. to what surrounds us here in our area. There is truly a huge amount of inspiration out there. Paula Smith, adjunct instructor of art at the University of Pike, our guest and artist in her own right, currently showing at the Weber Art Gallery on the UPike campus. And uh, you'll discuss your work yes. in the gallery during a reception. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. What are the details, uh, when, when and where? The reception is September the 9th. That's on a Friday from 3.30 to 6. Um, and I will have some re uh, refreshments there. But mostly I want people to come in, walk around, talk to me, ask me questions. If they want to know anything, sure. I'll let them know. We'll, you know, talk about the pieces um, and just get a chance to see. Most people think when an artist um, creates work, oh, you're a watercolor artist, oh, you're this artist, oh, you're that uh -huh. artist. But really, an artist can use any kind of medium. Sure. So that's why I guess my show is, will be eclectic. Right. It has a lot of different styles of art. And um, so I'll be glad to talk about it. And even coal included. And even coal. Even yes. coal included. Paula Smith, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. what you do. I have a huge appreciation for art. I have zero talent for art. <laughs> But I do appreciate a, a great artist. But and I'll it. tell you why you say that. Yes. Because you haven't had the right art teacher. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Maybe I'll sign up for that next class next semester. Paula Smith, adjunct uh, instructor of art at the University of Pike Bar, guest on display at the Weber Art Gallery on the UPike campus. Check it out. The reception, September 9th. You can meet the artist then. You've been tuned to Where the 99 Lead, a program brought to you by the University of Pikeville the leading university of Central Appalachia. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.